I'm the director of the Durham Drama Festival. Um, it is my great honour and privilege to be able to host this virtual roundtable with two highly accomplished and frankly amazing playwrights. Um, to my, well, to my, to my right, well, you are both to my right on my screen. To my, quite far off to my right is Chris Thorpe. Um, Chris is an associate artist at the Royal Exchange in Manchester. Uh, his performance work has toured internationally. Uh, he has collaborated with the Royal Court Theatre with a short film on climate change called What Do You Want Me To Say, which was produced by the Financial Times. His play Victory Condition was also produced at the Royal Court in 2017. Uh, more recently, Chris was named the recipient of the Oberon Books Royal Court Theatre Climate Change Commission. Uh, new environmental initiative and in playwriting to explore the political and social aspects of the climate crisis facing us today and um, any student who has been to the National Student Drama Festival in person uh, know that he is the heart and soul of the festival. Uh, he's an associate and judge and all-around organiser of NSDF. Uh, also to my right joining us today is Simon Stevens. Uh, Simon is an Olivier award-winning playwright whose adaptation of The Curious Instance of the Dog in the Nighttime toured internationally. Uh, he has 36 playwriting credits, according to Wikipedia. Is, is that right? I, I don't know. Did you like log on this morning and add? I don't, I don't know. I don't <laughs> count them. <laughs> I should count them. I don't know. I don't know. It might be right. It's about right. It's roughly right, yeah. The, these... Um, these include uh, adaptations of Chekhov's The Seagull, uh, The Cherry Orchard, Brecht's Drop in the Opera, and Ibsen's Doll's House. Uh, Simon has also taught the Young Writers Programme at the Royal Court Theatre for many years uh, and hosts their Playwrights podcast, so has practically spoken to anybody that is anybody in the theatre world in this country. Uh, and finally, Seawall and Birdland, two of his plays, uh, which I believe both premiered with Andrew Scott, uh, I've been performed in Durham by Durham students in my first year in 2018 and 19, respectively. Uh, so Simon and Chris, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to. Um, in terms of how this is going to work, we're going to have about 40 minutes, maybe more, maybe less, of um, discussion and conversation for you two. And then there'll be a small comfort break and then we're going to open things up to a Q&A. Um, if you're in the Zoom call, please send questions on the chat and I can read them aloud or um, just you know, raise your hand on your screen. Uh, for those of you watching via the live stream, uh, you can ask questions on YouTube comments and I can read them out um, to end about 3.30. Um, Simon, Chris, if, uh, as I, uh, I mentioned before, I've got two kind of um, sort of stimuluses, stimuli, um, that I want to bring to the table and discuss um, today. Sorry, my computer's just frozen, so um, I'm unable to look at them offhand. Um, forget it. So the first, the first thing that I, um, I'm really curious to hear you two talk about is this idea of the radical. So um, the Durham Drama Festival is obviously looking a bit different this year. Um, I don't need to state the obvious, but we, in addition to, you know, being online, we have a theme, uh, and that theme is radical voices for radical times. Uh, the idea being a stimulus, you know, a question, uh, a confrontation for anyone who's involved in the festival to engage in, to think about, to, um, you know, meditate on. Uh, and this is my kind of question to you. Is cool. there to be, um, sorry, is my computer all right? Can you see me? Yeah, we still, can still see and hear uh, you, Alex. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, this is my question. You know, wh what is, what do you think the radical is? How do you think it manifests in art and in theatre? Um, I think we as you know, young theatre makers, as young creatives, how should we engage in this question of radicalism, of radicality. Um, I don't know, is that, is that the right word? I don't know, of the radical in the arts. Cool. Well, that's a bold question, isn't it? For a Wednesday. The, um, what do you reckon, Chris? 
<laughs> you're, 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 radical. <laughs> you're the radical out of the two of us. I, I, I would, I would, um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say, I'd, well, it's interesting. That's an, that, that's an interesting place to start, isn't it? The, you know, you can, you can ask two writers that question and immediately um, there's a, there's a, there's an internal question between them about who is the most radical. Um, I would, um, I would, I, I would question whether the designation is actually any use personally yeah. <laughs> um there's a way of looking at radical which for me is about um the breaking of form or the challenging of audiences with subject matter or the exploration of stories which are suppressed or untold or the foregrounding of identities which um which perhaps aren't um usually foregrounded or centered mm. um in in the in the mainstream of work whatever that means um and that is that is that is a useful thing to bear in mind when you're in the creative process but it's uh because we you know there's a sense in which we all have a pressure on us particularly incumbent upon people like me and simon who you know, I, it, it has to be acknowledged that for a discussion about radicalism. This isn't particularly the most radical panel to have assembled in terms of its its demographic. You know, so I would say that particularly it's incumbent upon people who are able, if they choose, to just occupy a very comfortable position like we are um, to to think about these things and to to be constantly questioning whether your work is um, uh, confirming and supporting the, the kind of default way that things are done or whether it is taking positions that are usefully contrary to that. Um, in, terms of, in terms of how that radicalism then manifests itself, I think the key word is useful. Um, yeah. It's very easy to... Um, I think, and I've fallen into this trap in the past so many times, um, it's very easy to kind of think of radicalism uh, as the uh, the default position of engaging in a kind of a iconoclastic kind of uh, destruction of the existing systems um, and to kind of, and to kind of make that your default position um, and that to me isn't a useful radicalism. Um, it's not radical to start from a position of opposition in the sense that, you know, um, it, it immediately as a creative artist limits your options. What is radical is to look at every project anew and to be really clear with yourself about what you want it to say to be really clear with yourself, and I, and again, I'll say this is particularly incumbent upon people like me and Simon who are not put in uncomfortable positions by our identity, to be particularly clear with yourself about what the purpose of what you're doing is and to align yourself with collaborators, with organisations, with um, institutions in doing your work that share your values, uh, especially, hopefully, if your values are around challenging orthodoxy and finding new ways to think about things. However, that doesn't suggest that automatically, formally, there is an expectation or a duty on you as an artist to be radical, because sometimes the most effective way to achieve the thing that you want to achieve is to use a form that already exists, for example, or to use narrative um, which which feels like quite a mainstream thing to do at the moment, or to use like elements of classic playwriting structure, and that's fine. I think the the way to be sort of the, the way that radicalism works for me is inventing a new every single time the form and the process uh, that you're using to achieve the effect that you want to achieve, and 
the radical act is making sure that the tools you have to hand as an artist are as wide as possible in terms of your the reach of your work, the uh, potential audience for your work, the collaborators and the fellow artists you choose to make that work with uh, to give you the widest range of options, really, um, while never forgetting that, you know, um, particularly for us, like I say, it's easy to fall into habits where we we don't um, we don't work with people and institutions who share our values or challenge us, and and I think that should be avoided at all costs. That's my initial brain explosion, Simon. I'm going to pass a, it on to you to make a, sense it's a, of it. It's a it's a beautifully and characteristically cogent explosion. As kind of explosions go, Chris, it's been like funneled through a beautiful hole in the centre of your brain to project with clarity rather than kind of like shat out all over the place, which is how my brain explosions. My brain explosions tend to be a lot messier and uh, and defined a lot less by the projectile than yours. Yeah, I, I, I mean, every, every caveat that you offer, I'd kind of agree, which is probably kind of disappointing. Um, uh, and certainly every qualification of the validity of our position um, as kind of straight white cis hetero blokes in their forties, I turn fifty on Saturday. Uh, you know, I'd never use the adjective radical to describe anything that I've done. Would you ever describe your work as being radical in that? Like, you're not not the collaboration, not the production, not because it's interesting in your answer. What you do is you distinguish. I think in. in to use a word you insist on in quite a useful way, between structures of work and actual work, right? And having an alertness to the uh, the perils of conformity and uh, conservatism within the structures of work, I think is really, really intelligent and really necessary and incumbent on everybody who benefits from such structures to at least be alert to the privileges that, 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 that we have, or at least I have, enjoyed i think that and what's interesting then is distinguishing between that and the actual art like the actual writing the actual theater that you make uh and i i'd be really self-conscious about applying the adjective radical to anything that i've ever made or it feels like it's not the kind of thing that it's up to you to say no, about it, yourself no i think it's i, think I don't mean you personally i mean no as yeah. an artist i think if you started making art thinking I'm just going to be radical with this. You just end up with something which felt, um, uh, you know, just profoundly dishonest. And there's just a certain kind of, I mean, in a in a parallel way, there's a certain kind of man who puts the word feminist in his Twitter bio as a descriptor, <laughs> and I'm deeply suspicious of that guy when I see him. And I think there's a similar. Um, I think there's a similar thing with the self description as as radical. Yeah, um, it's kind of not up to you whether you are that thing or not. It's yeah. it, it judged in the <laughs> in the context of what you're doing and yeah. how you're doing it and who you're doing it with. It might be something that people apply to a particular output of you as an artist at a particular place in a particular time. But I think if you if you start to wear it, you know, pick that up and put it on yourself as a kind of cloak, you're on for, for, for everybody. And it's and 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 even even in uh, so 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 the question then is how useful is it for artists to think about that adjective rather than critics or thinkers or academics to think about that adjective? I I I. It's interesting. I like your idea that every time you start a piece of work, your commitment is just to start something which is new for you something you've never done before, look at the world in a perspective if you've never looked at it from before. It's not so much reaching towards the radical as reaching towards like the fresh or even the true. I like the idea of being alert to that. I, I think I always start, I start anything just, like the only way I could start, if I ever, if I ever, um, we talked, I'm sure we've talked in the past about uh, the Tom Hanks movie, Big, have we talked about the Tom Hanks movie Big before, Chris? You must have heard me riff on this. I specifically <laughs> remember that we talked about it, but it also <laughs> seems, it doesn't seem unlikely that we have. <laughs> you know, have you seen it? Have you ever seen it? 
I mean, I've seen it. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah. For people who've not seen it, I, I, I think it has, um, for me, the, um, the, the the still the best kind of way of considering where work comes from for a creative artist. Um, there's an there's a the, the setup of the film is a nine year old uh, boy is really angry with his dad who's a single father for not letting him uh, do what he's allowed to do and he goes to a fairground and he makes a wish and the wish is that he could be a grown up and he wakes up the next morning his wish has come true and he's he he has a he's a nine year old boy in a grown up's body specifically in the grown up body of of a young Tom Hanks which is fundamentally all of our dreams come true right um, and the comedy. To be, uh, that's you've slightly misrepresented there for people who haven't seen the film. Yeah. Tom Hanks doesn't exist as a concept in the world of the film, so it's not like he's woken up and he looks in the mirror and he thinks, "Fuck me, I'm Tom Hanks." I'm a young Tom. He, he he transports into the body of an adult yeah. who is an He's adult played. in this world He's who played is played by, by Tom Hanks. Yeah, although that would be quite fun. It would be quite a bit more Charlie Kaufman. Anyway, um, there's a he he goes on. Uh, various different adventures he lives all kind of different things he becomes a successful toy inventor a brilliant toy inventor is a kind of like genius in like this toy invention company uh, and there's a hilarious scene that uh, i probably misremember in the way that memory is an unreliable thing um in which uh, a woman who works at the toy company is kind of uh trying to you know is really attracted to him because he's he's played by young tom hanks so, so you know, who wouldn't be? Um, there's a hilarious scene where he's uh, he, she's very excited because he asks her over to his place for the night. And, she, and he's very excited because she's coming over for a sleepover. And the comedy of the scene is the misunderstanding of what a 29-year-old and a 9-year-old think of what happens when they, they spend the night in one another's company. She's confused by the nine-year-old signals he's, he's triggering off. So asks him, as a means of seduction, where he gets his ideas for toys from. And he says to her, and I paraphrase, um, I just think of the toys that I wish other people had invented so that I could play with them. And when they've not invented them, I think that I need to invent them so that I can play with them. And fundamentally, I think with every play that I've written, if I've started any play that I've written with a starting point that's anything other than that, then in some way I'm lying to myself. I think of the plays that I wish somebody else had written so I could go and see it. And if they've not written it, then I need to write it so I can go and see it. And there's not any attempt to be radical or to engage with form necessarily in any way that's just quite childlike. I just want to engage with the art because I like it. And that has probably a terrible political irresponsibility, which is distinct in, I'm just trying to continue your distinction between the, the industry and the working conditions and the process of making work. And I would try as hard as I can in as much influence that I've got on any of those working conditions to be alert to the political privileges, which you very articulately flagged up. But when it comes down to the, the, the creative moment of messy generation, if I think of anything other than what do I want to see, then I feel like I'm lying to myself. So I never think of myself as radical. I'm not also sure, and I'm, I really would defer to you on this one as well, Chris, whether describing 2021 as being a radical time is, is a historically accurate uh, kind of use of that term. I guess radical is an unhelpful adjective and that it's so slippery, right? T 2021 yeah. from uh, if you're in Durham or you're in London or you're in Manchester, I'm not sure how radical that is, but there are other places in 2021 which feel much more radical and other times in Durham. East London and Manchester that have felt more radical than this. And then the third caveat I have with the provocation is actually I'm not sure if what we need to respond to radical times is radical voices. When I first kind of came across the provocation, the thing that I really thought is actually we don't need to speak radically. We need radical listening is what we really need to do. Radical listening is a much more kind of intelligent response to a volatile time than radical speaking. Anyway, that was my response to the prompt. <laughs> I don't know what. I like that idea of radical listening. Uh, I suppose in terms of 
how I would understand that in the context of the creative process. I would, you know, I'm thinking about people here who might be engaged in a creative process now, yeah. either as writers or makers or whatever. The way that I make sense of that idea of, of listening in my work to myself when I'm making it yeah. is to try to be as aware of po- as possible of the of the of the different possibilities of listening that an audience can bring to the work right. and to think of uh to think of that as an integral part to think of the work the different work that a piece can ask an audience to do other than simply sit there and passively receive my you know my thoughts from on high yeah um which is never the, you know, which which is not a it's not a great look. When does um, that when does that consideration of different audiences' relationship to your work come in the process of creating it? Is that quite? It's early a, on? I try and make it an integral part of it, as in there's a there's a there's a way of thinking about how this work will be listened to and engaged with, that that then if it feels right for what the purpose of the work is, can actually yeah. affect the form of the work as I'm making it because I can write in those moments yeah. the, um, of different work for an audience. I can think about what can I ask them to do? What can, what can I write in the voice of this piece that, that actively and, and nakedly asks them to do, to do something other than simply do what they've expected to do generally which is to yeah. come and sit and receive yeah so uh so that act of uh, radical listening which i fully agree is like is especially sitting in places like you and me are sitting now where i would say that the day-to-day of our lives although it's profoundly changed hasn't been sort of altered in terms of its radicalism there's it's it's even more kind of mm. uh, it's it, 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 it's even more necessary that that we keep those channels open to yeah. to receive you know uh, information and opinion and argument and uh, you know all those important things from the places of the world where it is you know there are more radical forms of change going on. How do you go about? How do you do that? How do you do that work of listening yourself? I mean, that's, I mean, it's different. I mean, when I'm talking about it in terms of work, it's an yeah. internal thing. It's about saying at every moment, am I challenging? Uh, is there a, is there a way that I can more usefully challenge the way an audience might receive this work? Right. Yeah. In terms of the, in terms of the listening of like sitting here in my front room in Manchester and having the option to not really engage with the world because I've got work that I need to be doing and I have you know it's exercising the option to engage with the world and it's doing all those I mean this is way outside the remit of playwriting and just in like my you know just in the in the experience of the day-to-day it's about diversifying the media that you uh you consume it's about yeah actively seeking out the voices and listening to people who are trying to amplify voices that you wouldn't normally have found on your own. And to me, because it's, it's something that I do. It's about, you know, it's something that I'm interested in anyway. It's about looking at the places where people who disagree fundamentally with the way you think the world should be are talking, looking at the places they're talking to each other. Is that yeah? I think it's really, really interesting. Is that is that is that uh, like virtual spaces? Is this about going online to find these? And yeah. I know you've written about this in, in confirmation about. Yeah. That. So it's not about you know it's it's not about saying oh well if you'd like to read the Guardian you should read the Daily Mail. Yeah. It's about um, it's about doing something that's a little bit sort of deeper than that, both in terms of finding people who are involved with things that you are interested in, who have a platform, who are speaking and accessing and listening to their voices and thinking about that but it's also about going to the places where people you might not agree with congregate yeah and looking at how they speak to each other Um, is is it i'm really really interested in this in in um is that was that were they were those places virtual places before the pandemic restricted our physical movements to the degree that it has like how, how often do you get out of your house 
<laughs> it's like, I think this is the most important thing for me in my work. The the thing which is hardest in this pandemic is, I think, uh, I mean, I think you're similar. The fundamental creative nature of travel, which is not necessarily just going, you know, traveling to see work in other cities or for you traveling to make shows in other cities so much as just like getting on the train and going somewhere. God, this is my wife who's come to tell me that she's gone for a run. These are the students of Durham University. Hi. <laughs> Do you need anything? I'll text you. All right. <laughs> uh, she's gone for a run. I think she probably wants to know what we should have for tea. Um, yeah, the what worries me about the physical restrictions in terms of the t that type of listening, yeah, is just the very process of the platform of congregation being a tablet or a phone or a computer has an innate kind of like uh, conservatism in it, regardless of what you're reading or watching or listening to. And I just miss getting out. And I'm interested in what you do to correct that in your work. I mean, in a way you can't correct for it. You just have to try and find its equivalent with the tools that you're, you're given at any moment. Yeah. You know, so there's a, of course, there's a huge amount of um, uh, stimuli that we don't have access to at the moment that we would normally have access to. And yeah. just in terms of like walking into a new theatre building and meeting a bunch of people you haven't met before and finding out about them and their lives and sitting around and having conversations. Um, yeah. And it can't be replaced by necessarily... Um, you know, expanding the number of bulletin boards that you you kind of lurk yeah. on or, yeah. you know, uh, finding a new subreddit that's all about, a, a, you know, a political viewpoint that you despise or, yeah. you know, getting into watching videos of people 3D printing action figures, which uh, is something that I did for about two hours the other day. But um, <laughs> it's... Um, which action figures? I, I don't know. It's just it didn't matter. It was the process that I was fascinated by, right. not the not the kind of franchise. Um, it's it's a difficult one. I don't. I'm not sure you can replace the things that we we're, we're not allowed to access at the moment. But I think before, you. Before, can, what, what, but I think you can use the cards that you're dealt to. Right ask yourself if there's a different way that you could be doing things. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that it's affected my writing. I mean, I've written two or three shows in the past year. Uh, I've got four shows I've worked on in the past year, I suppose quite substantial, like of ones that are of a certain size. Yeah. Um, one of which is going to be produced whenever all this ends, you know, one of which uh, would have been produced in January if the, theatre in Lisbon that was going to put it on hadn't you know had to shut again mm. and two of which have come directly out of uh, you know I wouldn't be doing them if it wasn't for being in this new situation right I'll, I'll be really interested to look back when they're all done I suppose one of them is kind of outside of theatre mm. so it's like there'll be different kind of restrictions on it and strictures anyway but I'll be interesting to look back interested to look back when all this is done and see if the limitations that have been Im imposed on us have caused me to write in a different way I think it's a bit yeah. early to tell at the moment yeah. yeah what does that what does the um I, I felt uh kind of adolescent referring to the Tom Hanks notion of creating the toy that you wish somebody else had created so you could play with it or making the show that you wish somebody else had made so you could watch it. Is that, does any of that resonate with you or do you just think I'm stupid? No, I think I, I think I totally, I would express it in a different way, but right. I totally, I, I totally understand the impulse. I mean, for me, it's, you know, I wouldn't think in terms of big by, you know, as, a, as the movie that I would go to, I probably wouldn't have a go-to movie as an analogy yeah. but for, for me it's about um uh finding the thing that can be 
finding the thing it is useful to say in theatre that you couldn't say yeah. in any other medium. Um, yeah. It's not so much about having a kind of hot take about yeah. something and thinking, yeah. oh, that's my that's my clever spin on this that yeah. I I think the world needs to hear. So much yeah. as saying, how can how can I use the opportunity that sort of liveness, writing for liveness gives me yeah. to put people's brains in a state when they are interacting with the work that they would not be in otherwise. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's about, it's not necessarily about the story that I want to tell. I only use story when it's necessary. It's not necessarily about the characters that I want to put on stage. I only use character really when it's necessary. Yeah. It's very much about how the language and the experience around that language can um, open a box in people's heads that couldn't be opened by any other means. Right. And that the world outside the theatre rarely gives them, if ever, gives them the chance to open. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. So, like for that. example, you know, to you, like Confirmation, which is a show I did a few years ago, which is all yep. about confirmation bias. You know, um, it's not so much about making a show that is explaining to the audience what confirmation bias is. Although back when I did the show about 10 years ago, a lot fewer people had heard the phrase. I think it's much more common now. It's not about explaining what that is. It's about allowing people to feel the workings of it in their own mind in right. real time because yeah. of what the show is doing to them and because yeah. of what they are doing with the show. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, because it's it's something that rules us all the time, every day out there. It rules our politics. It rules our our interpersonal inter interactions. It rules our relationships, and it rules the way that we see and treat other people. And in a way, it creates a lot of the imbalanced power structures that need to be sorted out in in the world that we live in. But at the same time because it runs unconsciously and because it is just something which is inbuilt, we very rarely get that experience of being able to experience ourselves doing it in real, in real time. Yeah, right. So right. that is a useful thing for a show, for a text to be able to allow us to do that couldn't really happen outside of the room that the show happens in. I like the, I like the, uh, the return of the, re the return to the adjective useful when you talk yeah. about your work, it's really central to you, right? Really important for you. Yeah. There's got to be a point. There's got to be a point. And in a way, I suppose, if we're talking, you know, to drag it back to radicalism, it's felt to... It's felt to me that it's put me slightly outside of things. I, I would never say that it's made me radical, but or my work radical, but it's put me slightly outside of things at points to think of the work I'm doing in terms of its utility right it's felt like that that is a non a, a points has been a kind of non-mainstream thing to do because right. because there's a lot of people making work for the sake of the work and for the sake of the art and i make work for the sake of the work and the sake of the art and i don't think i, I don't think i would make any of the work that i made if it wasn't if i wasn't able to stand by it as a piece of art you know yeah. as much as I stand by it as a piece of thinking, the two have to work together. But at the same time, that concept of usefulness is probably more central to me than it is to other people, some other people. I don't know. It feels like even saying that, I'm kind of making an arrogant assertion that I do something <laughs> that other people don't, and I'm not really comfortable with doing that. But, it, it you know, it's definitely there. It's interesting that uh, raising that kind of end of the 19th century notion of art for the sake of art, kind of like Oscar Wilde and kind of fin de siècle idea that art can have value only in terms of its own, of itself. I don't know if I... Uh, you said something really interesting, which was uh, there has to... The, you value the utilitarian nature of theatre because there has to be a point to it. And I was immediately about to say, and I don't think this is true of my work necessarily, but can't the point of it just be that it's beautiful or that it's 
astonishing or that it's heartbreaking. I don't know if I would apply that to my work, but that was just a question that, you know, uh, I wanted to kind of ask of you yeah. and, of, and of myself as well. But the only thing that I'd, you've said that I would kind of like raise an eyebrow to is I'm not sure how passive even conventional theatre going audiences are. I'm not sure if even in the most conventional of theatrical experiences, audiences go only to receive and don't bring their imagination to it. I think I've got faith that even in, even in, even in kind of like some commercial theatre, having made commercial theatre, the audiences bring their imagination to that as well. Uh, and they're not necessarily there to sit back in their chair and receive something so much as they're leaning forward, hoping to engage in something which will be them willingly, willfully and happily bringing their inclination to interpret or to engage or bring of themselves or understand of themselves. You know, that's the only thing. I mean, I, mean I agree, you know, that engagement's an active process. That 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 yeah. act of receiving is is an active process. But I mean, what I'm saying is it's incumbent upon the work that is being received to, to ask itself. Yeah. The people making the work to ask themselves, okay, that given the audiences have turned up in this spirit of generosity or, and they're up for it, what else can I do? You know, why, it, it, it feels like a strange thing on the part of an artist to then take that for granted. The, um, uh, do you listen to Adam Buxton's podcast? Um, I, I heard one where it was really annoying because he was just... <laughs> It, it, like he it. went to school, didn't he, with Louis Theroux and, with Louis Theroux and, Joe. and his, obviously, Joe Cornish. Yeah. And they were all, I don't know, they were all getting together. Maybe it was his birthday and they just... Quite annoying. He interviewed... It, it was probably, it was probably like a even more annoying equivalent of what it's like to listen to this conversation. I don't know if it was quite... Two fairly point. similar, <laughs> two fairly similar men of a certain age. You know, needling each other about yeah. stuff that isn't necessarily fucking relevant. You know, in, in his last one, he interviewed Stuart Lee. All right, who said something which I thought was quite interesting about um, artists who've had mainstream success and uh, 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 and artists who've had uh, kind of like radical respect and kind of like respect within the industry. And he said they always envy one another. So the, the the artist like the like the like the guitarist from the fall kind of secretly wishes he was in U2 because his life or her life would have been different. And the guitarist from U2 secretly wishes they're in the fall because the kudos would have been different. Uh, and I, that popped into my brain when you were talking. Uh, Chris and Simon, I don't wanna oh I will interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um right. do it, man. Should we say Five more minutes, and then we'll open things up to everyone. Um, you can open things up now if you want. Open I'm things up now. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what you think you're going to get about uh, from five more minutes of this. I just, I just want the, the only question I was going to ask you, Chris, is is whether uh, is there any part of you that wishes you're a guitarist in you too? I is there ever part of you that wishes you'd made something that spoke to many hundreds of thousands of people? I don't know. It's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, I've written a bunch of radio plays, and I would imagine the total audience for them on any given afternoon is probably, yeah. you know, just for one broadcast of it is larger than the audience who've ever seen me do anything live. Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me. What? No. It would be, you know, that it would be... Um... I mean, I wish that... I mean, and at the moment, I'm writing a bit of, uh, you know, I'm doing an outline for a TV series, for example. And I would imagine that, you know, in the very, very unlikely event that they then take that look at it and decide to make it, you know, the people who've asked me to do it, um, I'll have to learn a new set of skills in order to be able to write something which is not necessarily takes into account the, the relative size of the audience, but the relative kind of, um, the very different way that that would be received, you know, uh, as, as in the, the 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 medium through which it's broadcast and stuff. And yeah. I, 
I guess there's part of me that looks forward to learning those skills, but I'm not in any way sort of, I don't, I don't think the numbers, the relative numbers bother me at all. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, Alex. No, I was just saying, with that, if anyone has any questions, um, can they either use the little hand icon here? Can you raise hand? Um, or just do that. Um, I think it might be nice if anyone wants to make a cup of tea or go to the toilet, like I do. Um, now would probably be a very quick time to do so. Um, unless anyone has any questions and we can just launch into it and people can dot away. Um, that's probably best. Why, you know, why, why stop it? Um, I, Amy, I can see your hand is up. Please ask away. Hey, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask if you guys have any thoughts on, because this is something that's been coming up in my course for English as well, for things like the contemporary novel. Um, a problem that we've been kind of discussing is the idea that the people who are going to be going to the theatre and are going to be seeking out maybe these more kind of avant-garde, for lack of a better word, pieces that are going to be exploring some of these kind of political ideas are probably not going to be the demographic that are going to maybe need to see it or who are going to be like have more conservative views. Do you have any thoughts on that? I hope that was expressed. In a yeah. No, I think that's a really key question. I mean, shall I go, Simon? And then you yeah. can... I think, Amy, the, like, that's something that I face in my my work. So I make, a, like, a, a couple of the solo shows I've made have, uh, for example, involved um, talking to people about ideas of nationhood, um, particularly whiteness, because I can't really speak from any other perspective, but the way that my identity fits into an idea of nationhood and in a lot of ways gives me a, you know, a completely unjustified leg up. Um, now, the average, I suppose, theatre audience in terms of my work that's made, like, for my, where the audience has probably got quite a lot of my contemporaries in it, will be really comfortable with those ideas and will be really on the same page. But it's there's there's a usefulness in in actually taking those shows and going to places and as you develop them, talking with people who who are not on that page and who are not necessarily as comfortable with the way that you do things as an artist as your Battersea Arts audience, Battersea Arts Centre audience might be. Although I'm aware using Battersea Arts Centre as a metric is a really, really lazy thing to do, and I apologise for doing it. Um, but it's not then about trying to educate that audience that you you think are not who 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 won't. It's about going to that audience. It's about the act of going to them becoming then really important. It's not about expecting them to come to you. It's not about talking down to them or thinking they won't be able to cope with you talking about things in a certain way, because of course people can, and people are particularly able to do that. If you, if you make sure you're taking the opportunity to go to them, to go to the people who might not necessarily come to you and to be in, in the spaces that they normally go to and to do the show there. So for me, it's a, it's an idea it's 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 an it's a you absolutely have to think about and be active in where you're going with your work not in terms of getting people to come to you because you are in the place where you think your work fits and they need to come to you it's about going to them if you like yeah i think that's i think i agree with everything that you've said uh and if i would add anything to it which I'd add just to complicate it rather than to kind of contradict it in a contradiction that's kind of like pushes it forward rather than stops it is that I also think, you know, there's the, the delineation you made at the top of your first answer, Chris, between the structures in which the work is made and received and produced and the work itself. I think what your answer there is about the kind of structures and the and where you, the work is disseminated, how you actively take the work out and where you take it out, out to. I do think there are considerations of the of the work itself that might affect 
who's listening or who receives it. You know, and I think there are people who who are making work that is seen by millions that uh, carries a different type of um, truth or a different type of force. It's not necessarily diluted just by dint of it kind of rece- uh, reaching millions of people. You know, I think I think uh, you know Hamilton has had a profound effect on people's understanding of the nature of race in American political history as profound an effect as any kind of like one, you know, one person show in, in kind of like a Lower East Side theatre considering that because the fact it's been seen by 15 million people. You know, it's had it, that's had a kind of real force to it. I, I think it's possible to make work that is seen by many millions that has, that, that has an impact as well. Yeah, I think Mark Haddon is a, is a, is a compassionate and humane writer. And just because his book was read by, I don't know how, how many millions of people doesn't dilute the force or intelligence of, of that novel. I think, I think one of the most uh, um, kind of like one of the boldest kind of theatrical gestures I've made in any of my plays was in the curious incident where the actors stop the play and deconstruct the kind of meta theatrics of what's going on. And that happens in, you know, we've done that in theaters of up to 4,000 people a night who all get it. And for a while think about what theater is and the nature of their role within the storytelling in theater. So I, I agree with you completely. I also think there are things we can do in the work that kind of raises interesting questions about who's seeing it. Yeah, it's true. Good question though. Thank you. Um, Lucy, I can see your hand up. Hi, um, I just have a question about um, your both your works with the Royal Court and this idea of the Royal Court as an institution. Um, obviously, it's had such a huge history and there's such a legacy to this institution. Um, do you think there's some sense of complacency as an audience that we just expect to be challenged or um, their work to be of a certain level? And also perhaps um, your experiences with the court in terms of when you first arrived there, did you feel this legacy um, when you first did a show there? Shall I go first on this one, Chris? Yeah, go for it, man. Um, I, uh, there's no theatre that has defined my sense of who I am more deeply than the Royal Court has. Uh, there's no, I'm not a religious person. Uh, and I don't have any kind of faith, but the the, the original um, artistic director of the Royal Court, George Devine, said that audiences choose their theatres in the way they choose their religions. Uh, and if there's a theatre that I have any kind of like religious affiliation to, it's the Royal Court. Uh, and I uh, study it and have studied it for 20 years, 30 years nearly. Uh, I'm a geek in Royal Court history. And I'm kind of intoxicated and inf- by it and infatuated with it. Um, and one of the things which that infatuation and that intoxication has led to is an understanding of its complex and contradictory history. So, you know, pretty much since they opened the English Touring Company at the Royal Court Theatre, it may be even before that, when it was the Court Theatre at the start of the 20th century, you know, run by Harley Granville Barker and producing kind of English language translations of Ibsen and, 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 and early Bernard Shaw plays, um, uh, there was a self-awareness of, the, of the, the, the perhaps elitist nature of an audience actively engaging in theatre, which they knew to be radical. And artistic directors for 50 years or 60 years now have torn their hair out trying to figure out how they can interrupt that or reimagine that or, or rethink that. And I think that would be something that will continue and is continuing under Vicky Featherstone and will continue after Vicky Featherstone. And like all good noble attempts will never be happily resolved. Um, you know, just the the rule court will all, always, uh, I think it'd be really interesting in Chris's perspective because we write in very different ways and our relationship to uh, to writing is very different. You know, the rule court for me, uh, in its history has tended to be, although there is a big strand of that history that's maybe uh, led by Keith Johnston and Ken Campbell and people like that, but it's tended to be dominated by playwrights who have written plays that they've then given to other other people to direct, who've then given 
um, those plays to other people to act in, as opposed to performing their own text. That has happened at the court, but it's rarer. Uh, but for those, and that would be how I would describe my process of making plays. And for people like me, it's just the fucking holy grail. You know, when I look at the plays that have been produced there, right back to John Osborne, right back to um, Edward Bond and John Arden. Uh, and it's a, it's a complicated history. You know, there are complicated questions about why didn't George Devine produce any Jewish playwrights? Why did he really not produce Harold Pinter? What was that about? Why did he really not produce Arnold Wesker? And there's a chilling possibility that there's a kind of that beautiful theatre that I cherish has also got complicated histories, you know, and and and, and Devine and Gaskell um, uh, tended to give priority to male playwrights. And although they would they would try and champion and find non-white male playwrights, the history would suggest that they have privileged white male playwrights as well. Um, so it's not an innocent history, it's a complex history, but it's in its in its in its mess and its errors and its mistakes and the potholes of its history, I still kind of cherish it. Uh, and yeah, it's impossible to go to the Royal Court. Although maybe, you know, there might be a load of people who just go to see a play who are not really aware that they, they're watching a play at the Royal Court. We you know, I got that a little bit with Birdland when um uh, we'd get a huge new audience that maybe never been to the Royal Court before, but were just infatuated with Andrew Scott. Uh, and they weren't necessarily going thinking about Edward Bond or John Arden or Carol Churchill or Sarah Kane. They would just couldn't believe that it was Moriarty kind of live. Uh, and their experience watching that play was just as valid as anybody else's. But certainly, um, uh, yeah, I... I remain in its thrall and remain deeply aware of its contradictions and complexities and difficulties. I don't know what you say, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally get all that. And we've talked before, I know you and me, in, in private and in public about the... Um, you know the, how important that building is to you and about how the, the you know the fact of you being a playwright is attributable in many many key ways to your experiences early on in that building as part of the writing group and as mm. you know um uh subsequently as a writer who was produced there and that that history is something that you feel you know evidently from what you just said is something which it's a it's a key part of that relationship for you to be able to feel like you're part of that history. And I, I'm not going to, you know, and, and as we've discussed before, I came, I came to writing in a different way. I, I didn't want to be a playwright as such. I didn't want to write. I, I'm not even sure I am. I mean, I write texts for performance. Um, but the, the route that I found to that was working with a group of people who I met sort of early on in my life when I was kind of 18, 19, who, you know, had a collaborative and supportive sort of mechanism for making work, uh, which didn't necessarily prioritise the idea of being a writer. And being a writer was something that I did for that work. And then slowly my identity as someone who writes text for performance kind of emerged from that. So I, you know, if you'd put me in the role court at that point in my life, I, I, I think I would have stopped writing because it wasn't, it, it wasn't a place that was geared towards making me the kind of writer that I, I wanted to be. So in, in terms of that history, it's something that's more, it's, it's less visible to me. Although I will say, I mean, absolutely, you know, when I have my, you know, uh, when I've sat in a tech for one of my own shows in the main space at the Royal Court and I sat there and someone said, oh, you happen to be, that's where Ionescu sat when he, that's exactly the chair that he sat in when his plays were teched here. You know, you'd, you'd be, You'd, be, you'd have a heart of stone not to go, oh, that's pretty fucking cool. But it's 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 just not as important to me as the people who constitute that institution at any particular time. Yeah. Royal Court wasn't really part of my plan. It wasn't really, and it's only a part of who I am now. It's not, I don't in any way kind of, you know, feel like a Royal Court writer, but I just happened to work with them. And one of the reasons that I worked with them, one of the reasons that actually they became accessible to work with me yeah. was when Vicky Featherstone took over. And then suddenly 
that place made sense to me. And in a weird way, I think I made sense to that place. And so a channel opened up that was kind of a, a mutual kind of communication that has allowed sort of ideas that I have and ideas that they have to meet and result in some work that has happened there and that is ongoing there and that I'm still very happily working with them as an institution but the institution to me isn't the history of the institution it's the people who are there now you know it's it's Vicky and Lucy and Sam and Maya and, and Millie and all those people who didn't exist in that building kind of I mean Vicky had worked there as a director but didn't necessarily exist in that building in the same way sort of 10 or 15 years ago and it's it's almost like me and the institution came into phase and we'll be in phase for a while and who knows what who knows what will happen and that is the joy that I get from working there I also think in terms of this being a question focused on a specific theatre and us in this discussion you know all of us being you know, people who are probably engaged in writing or or artistic creation in some way, that there's a there's a real danger, particularly when you're early on in doing what you do, and I did it myself, of internalizing an idea of hierarchy. You know, one of the reasons why we make art, one of the reasons why we do what we do is because we want to fill those gaps that can only really be filled by us, you know, in the way that Simon talked about wanting to make the toys that no one else has made. And I think that's true. But I also think that we we tell ourselves that tr that's true and that we don't want to have a proper job that has all the kind of career structures of a proper job but at the same time, we do internalise an idea that there is such a thing as a career pro progression for us when there doesn't have to be. And the idea of certain theatres being a goal mm -hmm. runs contrary to actually being able to give yourself the freedom to do the things that you want to do. And it's I am profoundly lucky to be to be able to work with the team who run that theatre at the moment and to be allowed the creative space to write and to make stuff for and with that theatre and to be involved with things like Living Newspaper, which, you know, is their ongoing and really brilliant response to the circumstances we're in and to be writing a new show for them. It's great. But I, if I see that as like the end point in a journey that I've been on, that the goal was to do that, then the week after I've spent a week working at the Royal Court when I'm on tour in a van with Rob and we're going to like an old church hall somewhere and we're putting the lights up and I'm doing a performance for the 40 people who turn up in that place that night, I'm going to see that as less mm. if I've internalised a hierarchy that says that the Royal Court was the goal. I'm going to look back and I'm going to go, fucking hell I was at the Royal Court last week and now I'm in a <laughs> I'm in a church hall in a small village in in the middle of uh, Suffolk and actually in some ways that's where I should be you know in some ways that's where I want to be and 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 falling into the trap of seeing particular institutions as a goal is yeah. is gonna really take me away from uh, valuing the rest of what I do which is just as important and I think um, you know I think these institutions are they're not goals in and of themselves but if the people are right and it is the people who make the institution and for me at the moment the Royal Court is doing great things with great you know and the people there are great then then that's you know it's a privilege to work there but it's it's got to be part of what I do not the not the not the end point. Thank you. Um, I think it's a good place to move on. That was a really interesting question. Um, so thank you, Lucy. Um, Francesca, I see you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, yeah. So my question was, what is one of or like the most interesting piece of theatre in your opinion that you've seen in recent years? Like whatever you take that to mean. Oh, good question, mate. Uh, shall I go, Simon? Yeah, go on. Minefield by Lola Harris. It's, uh, I don't know if you know it, I was lucky enough to see it in Manchester. It's been touring around the world for years. 
but uh, she's a, an Argentinian artist who mm. creates theatre pieces and she brought together veterans uh, from the Falklands War. I think three of them who fought for the British side, uh, including one guy who's a, who was fought for the Gurkhas, so was a, um, a Nepalese guy who fought. And then uh, three of them, I think, who fought for the Argentinian side and they make... they they make a show together and they make music together and they tell you about their experience together. And it utterly transcends that idea that when you bring normal people on stage to tell their stories, that somehow you have to either a teach them a set of professional theater skills, or you have to make allowances for the fact that um, they're just not as good as actors. It, it, it completely blows through all that bullshit. And she, as an artist has allowed them to be a company of artists and to tell their stories in the way that make them the most themselves and the structure of the show and the way that it juxtaposes their stories and the different styles in which they tell their stories at points. And the fact that at one point they all pick up instruments and they, they're a band together. They play as a kind of punk band together. And these are men in their, well, the British ones are slightly older because the Argentinian ones were generally from a conscript army, whereas we had a professional army. So the Argentinians were like 18, 19 years old when they fought. And our, our guys, the British army, were a little, a little older. Um, but to see all these men who are now in their late 50s at the youngest, you know, working together and talking about that very particular experience of that very particular war but talking about it in a way that makes you think about all wars in which um you know populations are manipulated and um and forced to to hate each other and fight each other uh, it's an incredible i mean i assume it's available online it's an incredible piece of and exciting uh, piece of um art and it it kind of transcends theatre in a lot of ways and really doesn't, you know, because it doesn't care about the bullshit that a lot of theatre cares about. And it just cares about being the most effective version of itself. It's true. It's absolutely tremendous. Chris, yeah. would you describe it as radical? I would describe it as radical in terms of the position it refuses to take about whether it's theatre or not. It's, it's, it, it's, I would dis, I would say that in terms of the way that theatre is normally made and the way that theatre normally treats the stories of real people, it is incredibly radical. I would say for its audience, whether it's radical or not, is literally the last thing that would enter your head when you're watching it. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, no, it's all right. It's, it's quite fun because it really, I really want to just choose something... Uh, that's in total polar opposition to that. Uh, even, even, even. Um, so uh, I, <laughs> uh, Matthew Watches' production of Present Laughter, starring Andrew Scott, the old Vic Theatre, <laughs> which, which was, uh, which is absolutely uh, uh, devastating and funny and truthful and tender and staged with exquisite grace and Andrew Scott is a poet in a body you know his, he, his body carries poetry and its intelligence and its and its wit and its um, kind of hu humanness uh, and I, I loved Minefield and I saw Minefield and I think all the same strengths of Minefield were applied to uh, Matthew Watches' production of Present Laughter starring Andrew Scott, the old Vic Theatre. <laughs> but that, that's a slightly playful answer because the spectrum between Minefield and Present Laughter is lengthy. And I'm sure both me and Chris have enjoyed many things on many places within that spectrum. And I would describe Present Laughter as radical. But uh, I was, I was, I was, I was going um, to. It's funny to describe it as radical, mainly. I mean. Well, I was going to pick you up on that because. Um... The production, um, so I haven't seen it, but I was, I was reading about it the other day because the uh, production team had to ask Noel Coward's estate if they could change one of the genders of the yeah, character. Yeah, change the gender of the, of the person that he, that he has sex with in a one-night stand. 
Yes. The original text is a woman, but was clearly written to be a man. Like, so they changed, they just changed the gender. They don't change a single line of dialogue because Coward was writing about gay love at a time when to be gay was illegal. Uh, and they just, I, I just think they, it's, it's so in the metabolism of that particular scene. So, in you know, Coward is a radical writer. And I, I think, I mean, I don't know. I'm really, I'm really unhappy with that adjective. So I'm, I'm unhappy about your insistence on it. No, 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 that's... that's I think, I think, yeah, I think yeah. Coward is a writer who writes with immense truthfulness and his truth can transcend the conventions of genre and form that were imposed on him. And if radicalism has anything of any value, for me, it's when an artist or a collection of artists are reaching to a truth that is felt they want to say something because they need desperately to say it, not because it, it takes a position on anything, but just because it's what they want to say or what they want to experience, or what they want to make. If that's where it's coming from and, and, and the, the existing conventions of form or structure or, or, or production or reception don't satisfy that, then you need to reimagine them. That's the usefulness of radicalism. It only, if it only comes from that position of, of being felt in that way, I think that, that's interesting to me. And I think Coward does that. And I think Andrew does that as an actor as well. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions. Um, Eric. Hi. Um... Do you know what? It's quite funny because I actually watched Present Laughter with Andrew Scott and it was so good. But um, anyway, um, I have a sort of, it's more like sort of asking for advice because um, as someone who is like, you know, like Asian, working class, non-binary, like all of that malarkey, there are some certain people who would see my existence within like the whole playwriting scene as radical in itself, which is complete bollocks because I'm literally just a person like I don't write anything with the intention of being like groundbreaking or edgy it's literally just as you said like writing things that I wish that I had seen which is basically just the normalization of anyone being able to be in theatre um but yeah I just kind of wanted to ask advice on like sort of separating yourself as um a writer and like as a person to your work because I feel like there's always going to be some sort of inherent audience bias of knowing who wrote the play mm. like I don't know for example like you know like Simon you wrote like people are going to be like oh you you're the one who wrote Seawall you're the one who and it's just that sort of like knowing your identity and being um comfortable with it but also being able to separate yourself from the work you create mm. it's a really interesting question should i go first with this one chris because you went first last time yeah. you go first yeah 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 go for it man. it's all right um i mean i i i i, I uh is it eric yeah the uh i i i don't know I don't know how valuable any advice that I would have would be. I can just kind of offer it with as much honesty as I can muster. The, the one thing that I would uh, personally, it's interesting because you asked me to think about myself and my own kind of like, um, uh, you know, my persona as well as my kind of like person. Yeah. Um, I think the only thing that I can try and do is distinguish as much as I possibly can between the work and the working life. And that in the space when I'm making the work, when I, and I tend to write in my office, I tend to write here. Um, and me and Chris are very different, I think, in the way that we m literally physically make work. But the way I literally physically make my work is just to sit at a desk and kind of write stuff down, um, first on a notepad and then onto a screen. That when I'm doing that, all I'm thinking about is the work. And I'm not thinking as much as I can. I'm not, I'm trying not to think about any work that I've done in the past or my career or my presence or my brand or anything like that, nor am I thinking about my gender or racial or sexual identity. I'm just thinking about the work. I'm just trying to get that right. 
and and it's not and it's not it's actually never possible to just do that but just because something's not possible doesn't mean it doesn't have a profound dignity in continuing to try to do it you know in the way that like there are many beautiful things which are innately doomed but doesn't diminish their beauty you know kind of uh if anything it makes their beauty even more beautiful my any if you possibly can i would i would just urge you to distinguish between your work and how your work is received and and you can't uh there there are so many things around the career structures and working uh working environments and industrial conditions which will define the way in which your work is received and some of those will be related to identity not all of them but some of them will and you just can't control them man you can't control that you can't decide who's running the theatres. You can't decide who's 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 programming theatres. You can't take responsibility for the economic consequences of this pandemic and how that results in the future funding of theatres. You can't control it. And if you try and control it, you'll just end up going crazy. I take great solace from the 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 Alcoholics Anonymous prayer, which is which I'll misquote awfully about just taking having the grace to change the things you can change and release yourself from the burden of not of changing the things you can't change and finding the wisdom to know the difference and the one thing that you can change is your work and so my advice to Eric would be if you possibly can and I'm aware I'm aware about of the ideological complexities of a white cis hetero middle-aged man in his 50s giving this advice to anybody but I would nevertheless give it still if you possibly can know that the thing you can change is your work and just focus on that. I think it will make you, um, I think it will make your your life kind of like, like emotionally kind of like fuller, I think. What do you reckon, Thorpe? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree broadly with everything you've just said, apart from perhaps the idea that we have no control over run, who runs the theatres. And I think it's incumbent upon people to make choices about who they work with and whether those, like I said earlier, whether those institutions and those those groups of people's values align with your own and also to be very public and very clear about the kind of change that you want and expect to happen when the opportunity comes along to be able to talk about it or even when the opportunity hasn't been offered to you fucking take it anyway mm. i also think you know and i'm going to echo simon here you know i i don't have the lived experience of being outside of everything i embody the fucking mainstream i live the fucking mainstream in terms of the societal pressures put on me so in terms of what you know the the strictures that you you work within eric there's a there's a different set of pressures that you have to navigate and in some ways they are quite well-meaning and you see them apply to a lot of artists who who are the kind of artists because of their identity that theatres are desperate to work with. You know, a lot of theatres are, are, are really encouraging kind of, you know, the representation of and amplifying the voices of. And that pressure, and I, I kind of think that that's what you're talking about, is we want you to write for us, now write us something about who you are or what you are. <laughs> that's not something that anyone has ever done to me. Yeah. Now, my way of kind of trying to equalize that is, you know, of course I can sit here and I can say to you, Eric, so, you know, what you need to do is you need to be making the case to, you know, to these theatres and you need to be getting quite aggressive and you need to be saying to them, you know, fuck you. I will not be marginalized, you know, allowed the opportunity, then marginalized in terms of the subjects that you think I am allowed to write about. Um, I'll not be defined by an aspect of my identity that you think is important or underrepresented. I will tell, I am here because I am an artist. I'm not here because of what I am. I'm here because of what I do. And I am going to do that thing and I'm going to do it in the way that I want to do it. Now, that's all very easy for me to say, because like I said, I don't face that pressure. No one has ever called me into an office and said, you know what we really need you to do, Chris? We need you to write a show about being white, you know. But I have chosen to do that because it is a useful option for me to take. You know, in the times when I've done that, 
or reference that at least. I have chosen to do that because I have the luxury of choosing to do that because no one's ever trying to force me down another path. So what I would say is it's not a it's not a thing that you have to do alone. You know, the resistance to that pressure that you might feel at times to only deal with a certain aspect of your identity or your your lived experience or your thought process as a kind of condition of being allowed to make work as an artist. Mm. If you feel that is happening, if you feel that um, uh, that that is um that is something that is a position that you are being kind of slowly squeezed into talk to other artists talk to people who also share that pressure for whatever for whatever reason but also talk to people who don't also reach out to people who don't and say yeah listen this is happening and if it is important to them that it doesn't happen and hopefully it will be they will i would hope find ways to support you because it's all very well saying yeah you know, Eric, fight the fucking power when actually it's not a fight that I can participate in or that I have to put energy into in the same way that you do. Mm. So I think it's about saying, if you're feeling that, reach out to people and talk to them about, you know, these these uh, these artistic kind of decisions that you feel you're being pressured into making and then see what other people say and see what kind of collective kind of action can be taken around it. And But ultimately, just write what you think is the thing that you should be writing at any, at any point. That has to be the starting point for you as an artist. Uh, I think for time for one last question, uh, and I think there is only one question left, which is good. Um, Olivia. Hello. Um, I was just going to ask, um, when you are uh, writing or adapting or conceiving a show or project, uh, what is your typical day like? Is it the same all the time? Does it uh, change depending on the project or does it change depending on the kind of development? of the project? That's kind of my question. Great, great question. Uh, Chris, do you want to go? Should I go? Yeah. I'll go and then you can have the last word. It always makes me happy. <laughs> uh, one of the things which I really l love about my job and also find slightly kind of frustrating about my job um, is that there's no real kind of like platonic form which is consistent and cogent. On one hand, that's great because it means that there's no real two days which are the same. On the other hand, it's frustrating because sometimes there are days that I wish I could live and they're kind of interrupted by various things. Clearly in the past year, like with everybody, even the norm of my kind of working day has been kind of like disrupted by, uh, you know, this fucking pandemic. Uh, some of that disruption has been really great. Like, it's really great for me now. I can talk to students at Durham University without having a four-hour train journey to Durham. If I'd done this gig for Alex in the olden days, I might have even had to stay overnight in Durham and kind of like have breakfast with Chris Thorpe the next morning, which would have been joyful. Um, uh, well, you but, would have been thinking about all the other things that you hadn't done because we were having breakfast. Yeah, there would have been an element of, 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 of writing I could have done, books I could have read, places I could have gone, meetings I could have gone. But um, given the caveat of the, of the fact that it's often, if it's often interrupted, my working day, I tend to work on an ideal working day. I'll be working on one thing at a time rather than two things at a time. But I'm very... Um, like I'm very uh, rigorous with my project management. So I kind of fundamentally know almost to, to the day what, at what stage on which project I'll be working on for like the next 18 months or certainly the next 12 months. Um, there will be days which will involve me. Uh, my days normally start at the same time because I get up and get my daughter ready for school. So I'm normally up at 7.30 um, and then maybe walk the dog and then start work at my desk at about kind of 10 o'clock. 
at the moment in the past year, I've started just doing kind of 10 minutes kind of meditation just because it's helped sort my head out in the year that I found quite frightening. Uh, and then I'll try and do about 40 minutes to an hour's reading on something that's not in any way related to what I'm working on. Uh, at the moment, I'm reading George Eliot's Middle March, um, just because I've never read it and I thought I'd read it. And I'm reading, um, uh, I'm reading the the odes of Horace as well at the same time, just for fucking kicks. And then I'll start work at about 11 o'clock, 11.30. And depending on the stage that I'm at with a given project, that work might involve researching, which could be reading around a subject or reading around a world. It could be watching films or looking at art or listening to music or um, going places and meeting people and interviewing people or just going to places to find a world. And I'll try and generate as much material as I can. Or it might be if I'm later in the project that I'm sifting through the material that I've generated, looking for uh, characters and story and action. And the, the next part of my stage is kind of the planning stage. And I'll do that in this office. I'll do that in my office. And then the next stage, once I've got the plan and I know what the story of my play is and what, how many scenes are in the play and who the characters are in each scene, and I know those characters well, I've exercised those characters, I've done character exercises on them, so I really know them, the final stage will be kind of writing. And then the ideal, the ideal conditions for writing, for me, really ideally, I've got a very thorough kind of like five to ten page plan of the play. And the actual writing is just, I, I, will, I will try and find either a week or two weeks to take myself away from my world like and like go somewhere else. And I'll just have an amount of, a number of scenes I need to write every day if I'm going to get the thing written. So I'll start a given day and say, right, my working day today is to write those three scenes. Because if I write those three scenes and I do three scenes a day, by the end of five days, I'll have done 15 scenes in a play that I know to be 15 scenes long. So I'll have written the play. And my job will just be writing those scenes. But I'll have planned them. I'll know, I won't be generating in that stage. I'll be just articulating. For me, the playwriting process is divided between generation, the process of generating material, selecting material, and articulating material. And the process of writing scenes and dramatic dialogue or dramatic speech is a process of articulation. And a lot of that stuff I'll do at my desk. And a lot of it I'll tend to do between the hours of, say, 11 and 7. Tends to be my working day is 11 and 7. And then if I'm at home, I'll hang up with the kids and maybe feed them if I think they deserve food that day. Uh, and then probably watch. Uh, I've got a whole variety of different programs that I'm watching, depending on who I'm watching with. So uh, I'm watching The Wire with my eldest son. I'm watching The Crown with my niece, who's living with us for a couple of years. I'm watching uh, uh, the David Attenborough Perfect Planet with everybody. And I'm watching Family Guy with my 19 year old, just because we watch Family Guy obsessively. So that's kind, and then I'll go to bed. I always go to sleep at quarter to one in the morning, exactly. If I've been out to the theater, if I've been out to a party, if I've had a quiet night in, whatever I've done, I turn my bedroom light, it happens that I turn my bedroom light out at quarter to one in the morning. That's my day. <laughs> I can't tell if you've frozen or you just look full of rage, Chris. <laughs> Do you think he was the middle march? <laughs> frozen i can't see him i think he's gone he's lost the connection <laughs> i think he's like fucking middle march <laughs> you twat <laughs> meditating <laughs> um right well i don't know if you know <laughs> i'm quite tempted to try and pretend to be him and see should i call him i could call him um do you know what? It's 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 half three, which is when we'd say we would end. So um, I'd have to rush him anyway. Um, I'm just going to call him. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> See Here we go. On. Yeah, he's back. <laughs> what if he's going to answer? I don't know if he's going to answer.
he's not gonna answer. He's gonna... <laughs> All right, don't worry. Yeah, he's not answering. I bet it was okay. middle March. <laughs> All right, that was fun though, Alex. Thank you. I've got a missed call. Were you just trying to call me, Sam? Yeah, I was calling. I was calling you to ask you if it was middle March that uh, led you to <laughs> sit. <laughs> my phone on Sam. I just heard you call. Um, yeah, no, my computer crashed. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> uh, it was just at the point where you were about to tell us what you were in exhaustive detail, what you were watching on TV every night. So, <laughs> no, it was good. It was good. It was good. Yeah, it was. It was. There was a beautiful comic timing to your departure. Is it Modern yeah. Family? I know you're a big fan of Modern Family. No, I am a big fan of Modern Family. Not after only the first five series. After that, it's awful, but almost fascinatingly awful. Hmm. Watching it de- collapse into itself is kind of like watching a remarkable car crash. But. Uh, uh, it's not modern family, but I've answered it. They know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, you know, maybe you can text me some recommendations later. <laughs> they're quite mainstream. They're not very radical. What, what's your working day, Thorpe? I mean, I wish I could go into it in the kind of structural detail that you did, but for me, it's like my time management has gone to absolute shit in the past year. You know, if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have said... Um, you know, I, you know, my ideal is, you know, I get up, I know what I'm doing every day. Now, it's slightly different for me because I tour and perform as well. So I might be, you know, I might be on tour or whatever. But I, I like my basic unit of knowing what I'm going to concentrate on is a day. So if there's a day in touring and I need to fill it with some writing, the writing that I'm doing, whatever I'm working on, fills the entirety of that day, ideally. But because the boundaries, because A, I'm not on tour, you know, I haven't done a show live in front of an audience since March. And B, um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm my, my working, my working space and my social space, I mean, uh, are my house and my computer, you know, the boundaries between those things have become really unusefully porous. And I would say the amount of, the unit of time that I concentrate on anything for has probably shrunk to about two hours. So I'm having to kind of radically rework the, how I get things done, maybe work later at night when there are fewer things to do. You know, I tend to, I tend to maybe have a little burst of work between about 10 PM and 1 AM. Um, and then try and find a couple of hours in the day to do it because there's still a lot of you know I've got a, I've got deadlines I need to hit and things that need to be done. I've managed to work, I've, but the thing that I've had to cut back and the thing that's really frustrating is the waiting. Like for me, the process of writing, the actual writing stuff down. Mm. Once the spark happens, and I don't plan as much as you do, but once the knowledge occurs that actually, oh yes, this is the thing that I should be writing right now. I will write it, but the, you know, the hour or so of just, or two hours of just waiting around for that moment. No, it's not really a moment of inspiration. It's more a moment of like, oh, oh, fuck, that's it. Yeah, okay. You know, I, it's that, that waiting around time has been so interrupted by other things that I'm finding a, I'm having to find different ways of doing it. Maybe I should start, um, like meditating for 10 minutes a day like you do Good man. i did you know i've been got i walked like i, I walk miles and miles every day and i yeah. i try to i try to do that i tried to start running again and then ended up um properly um bollocksing up my my hip joint which i'm now recovering from so it's like I'd, i have to find a way to cope with the the fact that everything is mixed up and the boundaries between everything have become really porous that doesn't actually physically screw me up. And then yeah. once I do that, I'll be fine. Oh. Yeah. So, you. yeah, no help, I'm afraid, on that score, <laughs> other than, you know, it's all right for life to be... It's all, it's all right for things to feel a bit chaotic, and if they do for you, to, to try not to worry too much, because it's the same for me as well. And yeah. Everyone. Some of the most useful advice I was ever given about the writer's working day was um, a guy who used to be literary manager at the Royal Court. And when he said, he said, he told me one time that 
for a writer, four hours is a really good working day. And if you're doing more than four hours a day of writing, then you're probably doing too much. So, I mean, for students, four hours isn't necessarily easy to find because you've got kind of other stuff to be doing. But um, that felt like a big release of pressure for me because I, I had quite a Protestant work ethic that thought if I was doing anything less than kind of the equivalent of nine till six, then I was being a work shy fop to quote Reeves and Mortimer. Is it Reeves and Mortimer do work shy fop? It's an eighties reference. I think so. Anyway, so four hours is good. Four, and so you're doing four hours, Chris. It's, that's good, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's just would be nice if they were able to be continuous. Yeah. But they ain't. Yeah. Um, it's 35 minutes past three. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to bring things to an end. Um, Chris, Simon, I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone when I express my gratitude for being here virtually with us. Um, thank you so much. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I'm sure we will have a lot to think about, both um, artistically and, you know, in our lives as students engaging you know in the midst of an international pandemic so thank you so much um that's it thanks for having us yes. all of you it's been it's been really nice to feel a bit less alone for uh for for an hour or two and thanks for having us alex yeah thanks alex yeah. absolute pleasure um, and you all, all of our events this week are free and accessible to everyone um i can send you through some details you can watch some of our online plays um, thank you once again. Thanks, guys. Thank you.